Welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. We're so glad you've chosen to join with us once again today. We've got a great service once again. Eric and the team will be leading us in worship in a minute. It's week three of our Where Do We Go From Here series, and Pastor Tom will be bringing the word. Uh, also, please stay tuned following the message as today is Mission Sunday. We want to pass along some information uh, for our highlighted ministry in regards to how you can support them and pray for them this month. Hope you're ready. I'm ready. Church starts now.
Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. Cause you have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. deserve it still you give yourself away
hearts, Lord, in this nation. Awakening, Holy Spirit, we desire. Every hour, awakening for you.
still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You've never failed me What a privilege and honor it is for me to have the opportunity of addressing all of us together as we walk as a church community. I never take this for granted, and the question that I want to look at today that is the title of our series, where do we go from here? I love questions because questions require some response on our part. We are required to come up with some answer, and the reality is no answer is, in fact, an answer. Where do we go from here? When we hit September, something shifted in the spirit realm, and I'm acutely aware of that. We went through the the spring, and we thought, well, we'd be out of this in a couple of weeks, or certainly in a couple of months, and certainly by September, things would be clearer. And again, we are now faced with the reality that kids are going back to school. What is that going to look like? Here in British Columbia, we had flattened the curve quite substantially. And then people have gotten sloppy and careless and thinking they're indestructible and saying, it's not going to happen to me. And so, of course, our numbers are climbing. So my question to all of us is, where do we go from here? Let's pray. Father, as we grapple with what we are going to do and how we are going to respond as individuals, as families, as couples, and as a a local church, and as the church, if ever there was a time for us to really discern where you're leading us, now is that time. Lord, we pray that you would help us to not only hear these words, but that we would say, what are you asking me to do in response to this message? I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I asked another question that's a follow-up, where do we go from here, is has church been canceled or has it been deployed? The idea of deployment is a military term, and Lottie and I, through the 40 years of our marriage, we have had the privilege of, of holidaying on the Hawaiian Islands and Oahu. There is a large military base on Oahu. And in, as we talk to different people and, you know, what's going on and whatever, and I, somewhere in a conversation, they said, we always know when something is up because overnight like that, that the presence of the U.S. military, it just disappears and we know that something's afoot. It hasn't been canceled. Those troops have been deployed from a place of training and equipping to a place that needs their physical presence and needs their involvement. It's a deployment. I suggest to you, church has not been canceled. We have not been able to meet together over these months. And just to let you know, this is a breadcrumb, that we as a staff and our elders, and and we have been saying, Lord, what do you want us to do? We are grappling with what is our next step? It is not the same as it was. And I'm convinced that the response that we have made up to now has been good. It will not carry us into the future. What does it look like for us to be deployed? This is not the first time that the way in which we gather has changed. And it is as old as the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, we read about how God gave to Moses the plan for the tabernacle, which would then be translated from a structure that was a tent to something that was built in stone and was there in Jerusalem. 
That temple, that tabernacle was a physical place. It was a reminder of God's presence. Now, the wonderful thing about the tabernacle was that it was mobile, and it taught us something about the mobility of worship. That worship didn't have to happen in a specific location, but that worship happened wherever the presence of God was. And so God help us if the presence of God is still not with us. I believe that he is with us always. He says he will never leave us and never forsake us. Now, as human beings, we get used to facilities. We get used to to specific places. And of course, my dad, he used to like to go to the same restaurant. Why? Because he was familiar with it. Well, I'm suggesting to you, I'm suggesting to me that this is not the first time that we have had to redefine and take a look at how is it that we are going to worship God? Is it in only one place or in a structure? Or is it something more? That's something I'm going to unpack. We see, too, that Jesus, he foretold of the fact that when people were saying, well, the temple, the temple, the temple, the temple, and it was a beautiful place, and we saw Jesus said, but, you know, you come to this place, but there's going to come a time where God is going to help us realize that he wants to have us worship him in spirit and in truth that is not contingent and dependent upon a building, but it is something so much greater. It's about the fact that we are the temple and he is with us and worship is not an event It is a lifestyle. It's something we do. It's something we are. It's not something that we are entertained by. And so one of the other questions that I want to invite you to start to dialogue with me is, is church an activity, an event, or is the church something far more organic? That the church is people. We've preached that now forever. When we first came, Lottie and I, almost 38 years ago, we began to talk about the church is people. It's not a place. The church is people. It's not a building. It's not something that's made out of concrete or stucco, but it's something that we are. So the, the challenge here is how do we, in this new reality, how do we walk out this whole concept of we are the church? I'm a compulsive confessor, and I, I want you to know I, I feel that you, I owe us all an apology. I don't feel that I was successful enough in this whole idea about the fact that we are the church, that the church is people. It's not a place. Now, I'm the first one to acknowledge the fact that we cannot replicate, we cannot replicate a shared corporate worship experience. In fact, in, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse uh, 23 and 24, it says, as it said, let us, that's a corporate statement, hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he has promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as is the habit of some doing, but let us encourage one another all the more as the day approaches. We have been confronted with the reality that how we used to gather, which I loved, is no longer possible, and we don't know exactly what that's going to look like moving forward. We've, you've heard us talk about the fact that, yes, we need to be together. Yes, we need to encourage one another. But part of this, where do we go from here? I want to just right out of the chute say that God is calling you and me to be the church. What is God asking for you to do? Things change. And so in AD 70, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, and in destroying Jerusalem, the temple was destroyed. Jesus said that not one brick is going to be left on top of another here. It's all going to be wiped out. And so the people were forced to look and say, how do we encourage one another? How do we worship? How do we become a true group of people? And how do we adapt? And so I'm saying to you, we need to say, God, what's the next right step? We also see, too, that Jesus signaled a change. And so again, that as we look at this, that they were in the upper room and they were hanging out and they were praising the Lord. They were singing. There was 120 of them, which breaks the 50 rule that we have here in BC at this point. But what happened was as the Holy Spirit fell upon them, 
They didn't stay all together and pray for one another, prophesy over one another, encourage one another, hear people speaking in inspiring tones, but they poured out into the marketplace. And a few years ago, we had a series about into the marketplace. So again, as we talk about this, what is our response going to be? I want to excite you about the possibility of being Jesus, about incarnational Christianity, about making a difference. I want us to be listening to that gentle whisper of God. As we talk in terms of being deployed, Jesus talked about that too, about being salt and about being light. And he said that we are the light of the world. And reality is we have the light of the world within us, that we are vessels and we don't put that under a bushel and cover it up. Whether you're here on a Sunday, whether you gather together in some expression of a local church in 50 or less, the reality is that that is only one hour of your time through the week. What are you, what am I, what are we doing to be light in the darkness? If ever there was a time for the church to be the light to say, this is the way we can encourage one another. We are not going to sit and lament the fact that the world that we knew has gone away. But we can say, Lord, we are going to take the next right step, that next step, and we're going to walk in your light. I bring. I have great comfort to know that I don't have to know a, a year from now. I don't have to know six months from now. I don't even have to know a month from now. I, all I have to do is walk step for step with Jesus and take the next step right step. We love comfort. I talked last time I preached about the pathway and about the principle of the path, and I said that we as human beings tend to um, default to the path of least resistance. I think that's what happened in the early church. As we read in the book of Acts that they all hung out in Jerusalem. They were going house to house. They were encouraging one another but they got too comfortable, and so it says that there was persecution. Now, they started off hanging out in the porticos and in the porches at the temple. We read that Peter and John at Acts chapter 3, verses 1 and following, it says, at the time of prayer, they went from where they were to a location. Why? Not because that space was somehow more sacred. It was a gathering spot. What do gathering spots look like now? The fact that we can't do church as we did it pre-COVID, we're, not, we're trying to discover what does that look like moving forward. And we are praying about that. But the spot wasn't sacred. The spot became sacred because people were gathered together in two or three. That's the smallest expression of the church. And they created a space of worship. They saw themselves as a temple. They were making a difference. But it was comfortable. So persecution came. And the persecution, it, it shook up the apple cart. It, it said, you got to get out of your, your comfort zones and you've got to start getting out where the world is lost and bleeding. Jesus talked about salt and light. And he said that salt has to be out. And if it's lost its saltiness, it makes no difference. It doesn't save anything. It's good for nothing to be trampled on. So here's what happens. If you exegete that passage of Scripture, that salt would get would get polluted and it would get mixed with other things and it would lose its saltiness. Salt, you know, the actual chemical of, and what is it, NaCl, that it was pure, but it got mixed with dirt and all, all kind of stuff. And basically what happened is when it lost its saltiness, it became only good for, they would throw it down on the rocks and it was cobblestones and there would be crevices and whatever. And so it had some use, but it wasn't doing what it was asked to do. We are called to get out of the salt shakers of, of being in a building and we are called to be salt. We are called to be bringing the healing and the purifying and the flavor wherever we are. So again, as we talk about that, we are the church. God is calling us to be deployed. We are not limited to a building. We are called to be people who are going to make a difference in our place of employment. And so to saying, oh, I'm so afraid. If you're someplace and you've got to be place, I think about our teachers. And some of you who are watching this are part of our congregation. Your teachers, that you have to be where the kids are. You are salt and light. 
And so I want you to know we are praying for you that you will be able to be used as you are deployed in that place. You can be a place of comfort for those kids. You can be a place of encouragement for your fellow workers that might be afraid. You can help parents who are saying, what's this all going to look like? We can pray and seek God. Yes, wash your hands. Don't touch your face. If you're called to wear a mask, do. But the reality is, let us say we have an opportunity to make a difference. It's all about meeting people's needs in Jesus' name. So they got comfortable. So basically what happened is is that persecution happened, and it wasn't that God was somehow asleep at the switch or on watch, but there was a persecution. And here's what it says in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 6. It says, On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. Does that sound familiar? That could be 2020. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen because he was stoned and mourned deeply for him. But Saul, that is who would become Paul, began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women, put them in prison. Those who had been scattered, this is important, verse 4, preached the word wherever they went. They weren't saying, come to 6749 120th Street and hear Pastor Tom or Pastor Lottie or Pastor Danny Jones or, or Danny Hunt or whoever was preaching. They would come and hear, but they, wherever they went, they preached the gospel. They, it wasn't that they were on some soapbox. They weren't wearing some sort of placard, but their lies were a sermon, and their lives gave testimony to the fact that we are not paralyzed by fear, regardless of what happens, regardless of who wins an election in the United States or who doesn't, regardless of what happens in the stock market, regardless of what's happening, the fear that would grip your heart, that we are called to stand and preach the good news that Jesus is not on holiday. He is in control. How do we deploy and make a difference in our circumstances? It, then it says that they w- preached the word wherever they went, wherever you are. So again, Uncle Jerry would say, wherever you are, he is. This is incarnational Christianity. It's not a philosophy. It's not relegated to a church building. It's not relegated to some liturgy. But Christianity is something we are. It's something we live. We are called to be incarnational Christianity wherever we are. Again, I had the privilege of, of being in China a few years ago. And uh, it was said that when Mao Zedong and the, the, the communists took over China, that they persecuted the church and there was very few Christians. And when the, the bamboo curtain began to rise, they, they went from uh, tens of thousands of Christians to millions and millions of Christians. And here's what happened. The communists uh, there, uh, I should say, the Chinese communists, I don't want to mix that, you know, that metaphor, or that particular thing up. You know, some of you may have certain communist leaders that doesn't look like the Soviet brand or the Chinese brand, but I'm talking about the Chinese brand. What they did is they persecuted the, the church and they took specifically pastors and leaders in the church and what they did is they spread them out and many of them were relegated to cleaning the latrines. Now, I was in China and this was like 10 years ago. And I was we had the privilege of being with somebody who was Chinese. And we went back into some of these places, not the cities, but the latrines. They're like here. If you think outhouses are bad, trust me, these were worse. But what happened was these very educated and godly men and women, they were cleaning. And as they went, people couldn't understand why they could have a song in their heart. And, they, and wherever they were, where they were cleaning out latrines or shoveling manure or whatever they were doing, they were living incarnational Christianity and the church exploded, not because they were meeting in places, but because the church deployed made a difference. What does that look like in 21st century Canada? What does that look like in 21st century Delta Surrey Langley? What does it look like? God is calling us to not lament the circumstances we are in. God is calling us to live his light and his power at a time where the world desperately needs hope. It says, and they went from city to city. They went to the city of Samaria. Philip was preaching, proclaiming Christ there. Verse 6, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention. They left the comfort of Jerusalem and they went into the uttermost parts of the Roman Empire, and the rest is history. 
I don't know how they come up with these things, but when I was studying this, that within 25 years of the resurrection, they said that a full quarter of the Roman Empire had converted to Christianity. This was before Constantine and the Melvian Bridge, but within 25 years, a quarter of the Roman uh, Empire had converted, and it was at, at the expense of their lives and persecution. And what my experience has been that God has, has worked his best at times of persecution because it forces us to know what we believe and are we going to live it regardless of how difficult it is. This is, sounds, should sound familiar because in Acts 1.8 it says, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, my authentic witnesses in Jerusalem, the city, Judea, the province, Samaria, those that are outside of our province and to the uttermost parts of the earth. We are still called to go. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the, the gospel, teaching them to observe what sort of things I've commanded. So here's my question. What can you do? What you can do if you're married, you can encourage your spouse to be more like Jesus. If you are a father, if you are a mother, you can disciple your children. We have this philosophy of, of Think Orange that we've embraced about our kids' ministries. And instead of saying, well, what can the church do for us? The reality is, what are you doing to live out incarnational Christianity in your circumstance? Think Orange. The red stands for the home. The yellow stands for light. You put them together, you get orange. There is a partnership of incarnational Christianity. We need to realize the fact that we have been deployed. God is asking us to live out our Christianity. What am I doing in this time? That's the question. Now, uh, we're going to do an experiment here. Um, I'm going to draw something. We have talked about how uh, Jerry Cook in his, mark, his landmark book, Love, Acceptance, and Forgiveness, it's an amazing read. Jerry, he talked about two different models or two different ways of doing church. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw them out here. So let's pretend for a moment that this rectangle that I just drew, let's pretend for a moment that, that that's not just a building, but that's the parameters of, quote, the known church. But the model is most people, if you ask them, when they think in terms of the church, they see the church as being a structure. Now, I'm a one for words, and it's really important for me um, that I say, well, I'll meet you at the church building. This 6749 123rd Street, this building that I am speaking from is not the church. You're the church. I'm the church. This is the place where the church meets. Now, there's two things. We have the model of the church as a field. And that's the most common one. And so basically, the church as a field is the most common model. And so basically, what happens is, is that what goes on is within the four walls of the church, that's where the activity of the church takes place. So again, what it looks like is, is that, that you, we, we talk to our non-church friends, and we say, hey, come to church, and come and hear an evangelistic message. I grew up during a time where we had, Sunday we had Sunday school on Sunday morning, Sunday morning church, and then we would come back for Sunday evening, and then Wednesday night, and it all revolved at that time in the 70s, early 70s, around a building. So the, 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 the appeal from the pulpit would be this, you know, tonight on Sunday night is the evangelistic service and it's vocabulary that was from someplace in the past. And so bring your non-church friends and hear a fiery sermon about Jesus. So we would bring people in. And uh, it's very interesting that when we, we have this church as a field, and, and you know, it, I fall into this even now, though I, I believe in the second, there's still this... We say, we'll come to church. Now, that could work. But I would suggest to you that most people are not going to come to a church service unless you have touched them. It's been said that it takes 10 clear presentations of the gospel for someone to be able to make an informed decision. So we say, come here, come here, come here, come here. And basically, this model, it's very program heavy. It's what's happening here. Now, I'm not saying programs are bad, because just stay with me, but the reality is, is that the program is not the end in itself. Oh, come, we have this great preacher, 
or we have this great worship experience or whatever. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily bad, but we just have to make sure that we have this model in its proper perspective. The reality is this What's happening in here only is of great impact if the people who are already in, in here embrace a very different model. And I'm going to draw that for you. So we're going to come back to the same, the same construct here. And this is the model of the church as a force. The reality here is that the field is you've got to bring non-church people to a building, to an activity. And we're going to balance this out. But right now, I'm just trying to make sure you understand this distinction. But the church of a, as a force, it operates very differently. So when, when, when the Christians, they come together, they come together to encourage, to lift up, to, to remind each other, to spur each other to loving good deeds. But what happens is, is that the Sunday experience, it becomes a place of training and equipping. And so basically what happens then is the people... They leave the, 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 the gathered expression of the church and they take the message of the gospel and they go out into the marketplace. Let's see if I can spell this right, marketplace. The challenge is, is that, that this is, is different. This requires something more out of us than coming to a place where we become consumers. Now, again, I love being in a gathered experience. Don't get me wrong. I love it. I miss it. I'm, this is the longest I have ever not been in a corporate experience in my entire life. And I want you to know that I have no problem saying that whatever else we do, even you watching this, I hope this touches you. I hope this has been food for your soul and for your spirit. But the reality is that I want to declare, I recognize the fact that we cannot duplicate a shared worship experience. And we need to say, God, what's the next right step? This isn't bad, but I want to encourage us in this, in the focus is what would it look like for Sunshine Hills to not only give lip service to the church as a force, but to truly be that. So regardless, so if we right now we're not able to meet at 67491 20th Street, but when we gather, what's that going to look like? What that's going to look like is this, is that as we get together, whether it's in, in by our time with, in our devotions, our time with our spouse or, or our few bubble friends, whatever, what we're doing is we are taking that message and we are making a difference. We are meeting people's needs in Jesus' name. And so basically what we're doing is you are being salt and light. I hope that that gives you some more to think about. And I have some more on this. I probably am going, going to put this on the church page. I've got a whole thing about what is the difference between the church as a force and the church as a field. But now what I want to do is, is as I kind of close this off, what I want you to, to realize, and this is the balance. Basically, what I want to say is, is that the church is a field and the church is a force. We actually, it's not either or but both and. We need both of these models coming together. Now, again, I've told you that I am a Canadian by choice, and I'm grateful for that. The reality is that one of the geniuses of, of Canadian culture, as I have experienced it over more than 40 years, is that we really get the fact that it's not either or, but it's both and. We, we need to have places where we can invite people. And so what we do here at Sunshine Hills before pre-COVID, we would have what we call seeker-sensitive events where you can bring your non-church friends, getting them just used to being around and realizing that Christians don't have a horns and two heads. Then we have other places where we have training and equipping times where people are being able to be equipped so that when they get deployed that they're reaching the people outside. So what happens is like there are times where we have field events and that happens when we have like Christmas Eve and whatever and we don't know what that's all going to look like. I leave you with this. God is asking for us to seek him and to seek his face, what's the next right step? What are we called to do from here? My suggestion to you and my encouragement to you is for this hope that's within, within us is that we be the church. 
Please hear that with your spiritual ears. Let's be the church. Let's not spend time lamenting what is not cap- we are not capable of doing. Let's say, God, what are you calling me to do in my family? What are you calling me to do in my neighborhood? What are you calling me to do in my place of employment? And if you're working from home, you are still in connection with people. Let's be the church. Let's be the church deployed. That's my challenge. Last question. I want to just stop you right where you are. What is God asking you to do? What will your response be? Have you, have I fallen in to church as a spectator event? Or have we, will we embrace the challenge that Jesus ate? Now go, let's change the world. Father, I pray, God, that as we have talked about this, my heart is full as we talk about the what can happen when the church really grasps what we're called to do. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be willing to, to, to give up on preconceived notions and ideas and say, well, it was done this way. This got to be done like this. It's always been like that. We have tried to say very cursory that You have been changing the methodology of how you are wanting your people to express themselves. Lord, we need your direction. We need your help. Most of all, Lord, we need to be people, individuals who will be salt and light, who will see that worship is something we are, not something we do. Help us, Lord Jesus, as we discover what the next right step is as we say we want to allow you to move us from here to there in Jesus' name. Amen. One last thing is that we want to just say if you're investigating faith, I want to encourage you to start your journey of faith right now. That Jesus died for you. That he wants to live in your heart. He wants to encourage you. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to help you realize you're not alone. And so you can pray, dear Jesus, I want to embrace you as my personal Savior. You died for me. You rose to prove that you're God. And I ask that you would come into my life and show me how I can live and make a difference. Amen. God bless you. I have the privilege of mentioning the fact that we are still honoring Mission Sunday. This week, as we talked as a staff, we said, where can we highlight that's going to make a big difference? And as we prayed about it, we thought about the importance of supporting our brothers and sisters in the United States with all of the fires. You have heard me say this before, if not, you're hearing me now. We are part of a global church, the Foursquare Church Around the World, International Church of the Foursquare Gospel. We are in about 150 countries. When there is a disaster anywhere in the world where a Foursquare presence is, we have now through the United States Church, ICFG, which we are now a part of, of course, that you can give and donate to disasters around the world through Foursquare Disaster Relief. If you want information about what they do, you can go to the Foursquare US website, foursquare.org, type in the search Foursquare Disaster Relief, and you can see all that they're doing. So this particular week in this month, if you would like to contribute uh, missions dollars, you can do that through Sunshine Hills Foursquare Church, just like we've always done, just somehow indicate either on your envelope or somehow when you send your, your donation, say Foursquare Disaster Relief, and it's going to go towards the uh, fires there in the United States to help them. I know I've, I've seen some of my friends who are, are pastors down in the Foursquare Church in the United States, in Oregon, and in, in uh, Oregon, and Washington, and places And their churches are on the front line. They are feeding people. And so I believe it's really important for us to do that. So that's our focus for this month. Foursquare Disaster Relief designated towards the fires in California. And I'd like an opportunity, if we could, to just pray. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus, as there are those that are still fighting the fires, and of course this week we have felt the impact of that through our air quality 
But Lord, it's a small um, inconvenience compared to people who have lost everything. We pray, God, for the Church of Jesus Christ to be there comforting and encouraging and providing physical and financial help. So Lord, I pray that you'll help us, Lord Jesus, to remember that we truly are our brother's keeper. We pray, Lord God, that you would undertake and move sovereignly in the midst of this crisis. And we thank you for a global church that allows us to respond without any kind of administrative cost that when we give, it goes right straight to the need and it's expressed through people who are followers of you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.